So my aim today is to talk to you about public choice. I assume you guys have at least heard of public choice before. What I wanted to do is try to give you a reason why you should be concerned about it or think about public choice. So I call this the public choice perspective. And I want to identify the problem. And the problem I'm going to identify is going to talk about you know, the politics versus economics, and then I'm going to tell you that what we have to do on both sides of that coin is avoid idealism. All right, so politics versus economics. Here's the basic dichotomy that I have in the back of my mind when I think about the way people choose to, to think about politics. One is to think of the Zoom politicon. Right? This is a Greek word, it just means political animal. All right? What's really interesting about the tradition where people think about the Zoom politicon is that it's necessary a social idea. So everyone starts from a community. Everyone's in a group. Right? So everything you do comes from some sort of context and you're necessarily in relation to other people. What you hear when people talk about homo economicus is that the economist is a reductivist, the economist is um, you know, self-interested, purely rational, sits alone right, in a room, reads a bunch of books to know about the world, rather than being placed squarely in the context of society. So this is a distinction that I want to say, if you fall prey to this distinction, then you're not going to understand the public space. You need both politics and economics. So we have to figure out in what ways that we use the sociability to understand the political world, but we also want economics. Politics is the study of groups. You'll hear things like compromise. The most important thing that economists care about, we'll talk about mathematically, is aggregating preferences. So if you're thinking about what the purpose of politics is, getting people to get together and decide on what should be done, given that they all have different preferences, is really important. So we're going to solve these collective action problems. Often those different preferences hang people up where they're not getting together and doing what would make everyone better off. All right, so if you think about economics in this purely sort of nationally self-interested way, um, atavistic, if you will, a very individual approach, then you're gonna think of economics as studying only things with a price. The kind of things that you're gonna study are what you can get data for, right? It's all numbers, it's all price, it's all what a market is dominated by what is bought and sold only. Um, you, then you have to have a perfect competition model. My opinion, the perfect competition model is just a starting point where you can find where the pathologies of the market are. Every particular market that we look at is going to have some weakness, at least in information or asymmetry, if not an infinite number of buyers, infinite number of sellers, profit maximization, all of those things. I think you should work within that model, but at every point along the way, you should check to see how far you are from that ideal. It's a starting point to measure difference, not as an ideal that should be brought out into the world. I mentioned the rational actor assumption. I'm going to talk about that in a, little bit, a little more. But we're going to get a lecture on the failure of the market failure argument. If you think that you can identify market failure, you've got a lot of work to do. Because if you take this strict economics approach, then almost everything you're going to look at is a market failure. Okay, so what's the alternative? So a guy, Richard Wagner, uh, one of my professors at George Mason, thinks about the world in terms of fiscal sociology, his term. All right, what that really means is, here's a picture of uh, where my, my wife went to college. This is Aachen in Germany. It's an uh, exhibition of Pell in French, it's right on the border of Germany and France, um, in Belgium. So notice the, the Christmas market here, in the middle of the square. All right, this is the rat house, where all the political stuff goes on. Here's what the market looks like when it's a little bit less uh, populated. Imagine a market when you think about it sitting right there in the shadow of government. During the week, everybody's going to come out in the past, they would have trials. It's like the Roman Forum. It's the center of political, economic, and social life. Everything's happening in the same physical space. What's different is what's being maximized at any point in time, what you're, the lens you're looking at the world through. So Monday through Friday, you can think about it as a purely political space. Saturday, it's a trade fair, a market. Everybody comes and brings their wares and exchanges according to perfect economic uh, interactions. And on Sunday, it's a completely different thing because in this picture, you can see the spire of the, the of Charlemagne's cathedral, uh, the, the cathedral that Charlemagne was uh, recognized as Holy Roman Emperor. Okay. So on Sunday, it's a different space. Saturday, it's a different space. Monday through Friday, it's a completely different space. If you start thinking about the world from this more comprehensive perspective, you're going to end up with something like public choice. The economic reasoning applied to political decision making. Okay. So here's how we're integrating markets and politics, economics and politics. And what this is going to do is have, give us a way to 
critique different forms of idealism that come through in, in these different contexts. I'd hope you'd all recognize these figures, right? How many people know all three of them? Feel confident. I'm not going to ask you, but you, you feel confident you know that one. So, this guy right here is John F. Kennedy. Right? This guy is, is Reagan, and this is Cory Booker. Cory Booker was famous as a businessman that, that uh, went back went to his hometown, saw a lot of stuff he wanted to fix, and went into politics. He's got a very romantic version of why he's in politics. He's actually still living, so I wanted to throw somebody in there that was still living that is idealized this way. Um, JFK was martyred. Um, Reagan, you guys probably have heard of him. Right? What he's got here is an act. It was this story that he went out and, and worked on his ranch, right? Uh, so he was a, a president that wasn't afraid of work. You know, these stories that we tell are these idealized stories about how these people are actually real, down to earth, people that you want to want to know. Here's the other side of the story, though, right? When you when you think about you know looking in investors versus daily, these different types of headlines, you'll see how both of these people have used their positions to enrich their families. People are connected to them closely, have transferred their, their funds to families. This guy, this is Charlie Rangel. Uh, he's retired now, but he was brought up on 12 different uh, He was censured for ethics violations. Still kept his job, kept elected. Uh, this guy, I don't know if you recognize him. <laughs> right? Richard Nixon is almost a caricature of political corruption. So, uh, so, what we're looking at is a story of idealism. When you're told political stories, you're going to see that you're, you're prone to just accept these idealized narratives. What we were talking about earlier is equality as an idealized. As long as you're willing to look at equality with a pure, cold, rational lens, I can talk to you about it. If we want to do the idealism, I just get a weird taste in my stomach because of my training as an economist. In fact, I probably was at it before I was trained, which is why I was attracted to economics in the first place. But I look at this picture a completely different way than you're meant to look at the picture. And I've had to study art history and how people talk about art to understand how most people look at this picture. Right? I see it with a completely different lens. You guys see what it was meant to see. It's an impressionist painting. It's from La Petite Boulevard. It's in Provence. These people are bringing in a harvest. You can imagine yourself going there and sitting in the French countryside, maybe near some, uh, some nice uh, harvest, maybe plants drinking some wine, having a good time. How many people think they'd like to do that sometime in their lifetime? They'd like to go sit in the French countryside on a nice, sunny day, but not too warm, and drink white wine, okay? So the idea here is that at some point in the past, this was how a lot of people lived in the countryside. They had leisure, they enjoyed the nice sun, it's beautiful climate, this is where some of the, you know, the, the romance comes in. And policy is set this way. The agricultural subsidies in France allow people to still have large agricultural farms in France to this day because it's such an integral part of how they see their own culture. Right? What does the economist see when they see this? Recognizing that this is early 19th century, the only thing I can think about is that Wait. all of these are like <laughs> gender dividers. Now I'll move away from that slide because I don't want you to you know, have to look at it, right? It's repulsive. But the idea here is, is that the realist always peels away all of the sort of emotion of voting things and looks at the cold hard analysis. Now, I'm not suggesting that you should become a realist. What I'm saying is, just an economic point, there's a division of labor. You need people like me and Peter to, to constantly bring up the realist point so that you don't get too wrapped up in the idealism. You don't get too carried away. But you also want to make sure that we're not idealists either. Right? You don't want us to sit there and say things like, the market's going to fix everything. Right? You want to actually peel back and look at the lens. So how do we apply this to something like a foundation death of the United States? I think that the foundation death of the United States is really important. I love the Constitution. Right? We talked about it last night, what it was intended to do, and how it changed over time. It's a starting point to think about what, what you might do. So the idealist version of this story is that you had a unique moment in history where a bunch of really well-trained and smart individuals with the leisure to study and talk about politics got together, shared ideas, and wrote a document. Right? And the document was, we did something that had never been done before. It elevated the idea of representative democracy above monarchy. That right? sounds good. That's the idealist part. The other side of that story, a realist might say, look, the reason the Constitution got its form is not because these people were really smart, it's because they could agree on almost nothing. They have a bunch of different religious backgrounds, they're all worried about each other, you know, they've all fled other countries, they're scared to death that somebody's going to get in charge, 
And the first version of this was the Articles of Confederation, and this was only one step closer to, to get enough power just to hold them together to prevent them from being targets from other world powers. Right? So the realist is looking at this in a completely different way than the way that a political idealist would look at it. Okay? I think you need both of those perspectives. I'm not suggesting that you can do just one, but I'm telling you how, why I think you should invite me to participate in the conversation. So the, the warning to the audience is that I'm critiquing idealism itself. I'm not saying that it's useless, but I am saying that you cannot substitute one form of idealism for the other. The false dichotomy that we get here is that everyone that talks about markets is a market idealist, so we can ignore everything they say. Or, you know, for people coming from my background, everything that a political idealist says is idealism, so we can just ignore that. Okay? What we want to do is, is try to figure out what the goal is, and then try to figure out what the cause and effect strands are. We're trying to be cold, hard, uh, rationalist, and see if the cause and effect actually works. All right, so that's the sort of background that we're looking at to explain uh, what I'm going to tell you about public choice. So where does public choice come from? So public choice, uh, you can probably locate right at the Calculus of Consent, 1962. Uh, this is James Buchanan accepting the Nobel Prize uh, in 1986. The three planks of the, of the public choice society that they advertise widely are methodological individualism, national choice, and politics exchange. All right, we're going to talk about those in a little bit more detail. But you know, the, these are the ideas right, that you start to see the economics in it, this individualism. Uh, don't be scared of the individualism because it's, a, it's got this uh, weakening word, methodological, and I'll explain what that means. Rational choice, don't, don't read that as everyone who participates has to be fully rational. We'll talk about that. And the politics, the politics is exchange is recognizing that just like in all other aspects of, of your life where you exchange, when there's reciprocity between, between people, so too politics. You don't get out of that relationship. Really, this is looking at the, the political environment as if it's a space that we all inhabit and take on different roles at different times. But the theories that predict how we're going to behave have more in common than they are in All right. So why study public choice? Public choice arose as a critique of traditional political science as being excessively idealized. Right? Public choice is a realist approach. So evaluate it on those terms. All right, so what we're going to do in the remaining part of the lecture is just talk about voting, where, the way it should work, the way I think it actually works, and we're going to talk about trying to solve problems that arise from voting by thinking about how we elect representatives. Then I'm going to try to discuss implications and tell you what now that you sort of thought about public choice, you've walked with me on this talk about public choice, how you should start thinking about the world. Alright. So here's voting. We're going to talk about the way it ought to work and the way the public choice sees it. Alright. So if you want to think about voting, the median voter theorem is a great place to start. Have, has anybody heard of the median voter theorem? Right. So the idea is that, that there's a set of conditions where you, you try to decide a particular issue. Right? And everybody lines up based on their preferences. Usually it's some sort of counting variable, and you can line up in order. And the person's preferences that falls directly in that measure of center, the median, right in the middle, counting number of people. Right? So there's 100 people, the, uh, well, there's 101 people, the 50 person, 51st person makes the tie breaking vote. Right? So the median is really where we look. And we can look at the median in a couple of different ways. There's some of the ways that we add complexity to this is to say that maybe there's you know, conservatives and liberals and they lump on either side of the median, so it doesn't have to be a perfect distribution, but still the median is deciding the vote. So it should be robust against sort of clustering at the tails. It's not perfectly normal distribution. All right. So here's how we start reporting on it. So I just pulled this off uh, the website when I was preparing for the talk. These are ways that people talk about it here. It's Clinton's and Trump, if you don't like that decision, Obama and Romney. And what's really happening is we're, we're talking about these undecided voters. This is saying that these undecided or swing voters are really sitting at the median. Right? And so we, these the, the people that are partisan have already made their minds up. Right? They're not, they're, you know, my, my parents watch both news channels because they want to confirm their beliefs on one station and confirm their beliefs on the other station. That the other people are crazy, that their people are sane. Right? Mm -hmm. I don't know if your parents are at the age where they're watching uh, talk you know, news all the time, but mm -hmm. people retire and they turn on CNN, they get tired of that, and switch over to Fox News, it, and it either confirms one or the other. Mm -hmm. right? 
That's the only purpose, as far as I can tell, news exists, is just a confirmation bias. <laughs> but other people are consumers of information. They're going to consume the information here in the middle, and we have to get the information out to them, and they flip the boat. How do we think about that? Well, here's another representation. If you didn't see it in my previous graph, the people in the middle, that as long as the media is somewhere in here, we have a good chance of getting a result in an election. Who's better president? by appealing to the people that are undecided. That's our real target. All of the information should be geared towards them. If you're trying to promote your information, you're gonna find out who they are, and you're gonna to try to get information in their hands. That's how you switch the outcome of an election. Okay. All right, so as long as people are randomly distributed around the center, then their votes cancel each other out, right? As long as there's no particular reason that people become Republicans or Democrats, once they're there, they're kind of locked in. But as long as it's somewhat random, it's going to be evenly distributed, either through that normal distribution or, like we said, a bimodal distribution would also work. Okay? So the informed voters could become the one who cast a tiebreaker vote. This is how it works. Right? You've got a spectrum, that same spectrum we had when we had the, the probability density function over here. And the person in the middle is making the tiebreaking vote. And if you have 110 or informed voters, these people are canceling each other out because it's randomly distributed. And the ones in the middle, all you need are a few people to get information and break the tie. Okay? So you'd still get good outcomes. Right? That's the whole way it should work. Right? That's, that's the, what you would want to happen on issues that are decided through some sort of voting, whether on the committee or in the public. As long as you have some of these informed voters. Now, I'm going to bring up later the idea of misinformed voters, but as long as the informed voters outnumber the misinformed voters, you're going to get good decisions when you apply it to the voting process. That's the theory. That's the ideal. Remember, they're randomly. The, the people that are not informed are randomly distributed between the two chaos. So then the implication is clear, right? Raise the cost of being misinformed, right? Tell people that they believe things are not so. Give them information so they correct it. Make them less confident in their misinformed beliefs. And then lower the cost of information. Get good information out there. And you'll, the people that are aware, the people that are watching for good information, will get there. That's the idea. All right, so how does it actually work? So here are two things I'm going to focus on to talk about voters. One is rational ignorance and rational irrationality. Have you guys heard of these terms before? Anybody seen Brian Gap? So what Brian Cowlett has made is a distinction between these two types of arguments, between ignorance and irrationality. I think it's really important to explain what's going on with public choice kind of thinking, so I'm going to spend some time talking about this. We're all, how many people know string theory fairly well? Okay. So, you know, I can watch a TED talk on string theory or watch Charlie Rose interviews somebody for an hour, and I think I know about string theory, but I'd be hard-pressed to, like, actually get very far in telling you what it means. All I know is really cool, it's really complicated, it's useful information and understanding the world. Some of the brightest minds are working on it. But I don't have time to become fully informed on string theory. Can you guys hold that against me? Right? It kind of makes sense that there are some things that, I, that I'm not fully informed on. Right? Well, because I'm not fully informed, we don't hold that against me, we just say that it's, it was rational. I did other things with my time. Right? So I made a choice about how to allocate my time. The information's out there. I think I could be informed. I don't know. Do you think I could figure it out yeah. if I spent the time? Sure. Yeah. So I mean, if I spent the time, I would actually probably get closer to understanding the truth of this. It's, I think it's worth it from all accounts. <clears throat> but the cost of gaining the knowledge is greater than the benefit right, in my daily life. I'm not called on to actually talk about that. Um, I'm not called on to represent those ideas. Therefore, I haven't spent as much time to talk about all right, here's rational irrationality. How many people believe the world's flat? Anybody want to admit it? They go to the Flat Earth Society? There's actually a group called the Flat Earth Society that gets together and they have parties. I can only presume that the parties are pretty good because there's not a great reason other than that to be involved in the Flat Earth Society. Right, so the buffets are probably really good because they keep getting people together and talking about how the world's flat. Um, I don't really have a problem with that as long as it's not my airline pilot or my boat captain, right? I'm part of geologists, right? 
I don't really care that they have that, those very strange beliefs because they're not going to encounter a situation where it really matters. So my prediction of the kind of people that go to the buffet of the Flat Earth Society are the people who don't have jobs that actually have anything to do with knowing that the Earth is a globe. Right? They don't pay any cost for it. So the fact that these people exist, I don't just describe it that there's something really wrong with them. I say they indulge in a belief that's kind of fun and clever to have, and they don't subject themselves to any feedback in which they would be penalized for having that belief. That's my general model for believing absurd things. Okay. So I think that this demand curve for totally bizarre things to believe or irrational beliefs is, has a downward sloping. You would consume less crazy stuff if you had to pay a higher cost for it. You have fewer crazy ideas or you'd hold your crazy idea less intensely if you had to pay a high cost for it. That's the whole idea with the academy, right? Like you would think that I don't have too many just totally bizarre opinions on economics because that would cause me a lot of professional problems. You would expect that John doesn't have too many crazy ideas within the law community because he would pay a high cost for holding this belief. <laughs> right, this is the model. Also to hear. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So one of the reasons that we think that in political decision making that people hold a lot of very strange beliefs is because no one knows how they vote, and it's impossible to sustain through rational thought the idea that your vote will break the tie in an election. Okay, so I'm going to back that claim up because that seems to be something that people take issue with and want to argue about. So you can take the normal approach to say that in a state like New Hampshire, where you have the best margin of casting the tie-breaking vote, statistically, here, here's your probability of casting a tie-breaking vote, that's fine. But anybody that remembers Florida in 2000, there was about a 5,000 uh, swing, one way or the other, with the way they were counting ballots in Florida, and it was gonna change the outcome of the election. Right? Even within a margin of error of 5,000, they could not resolve it, they could not count the votes, and it went to the Supreme Court. So we can argue about statistical probability of being the one person to cast the tie-breaking vote all we want, but I'm telling you that the way that count votes right now, we can think of better ways to count them if you'd like. But the way we currently count votes, you're never going to get that close. It's impossible to get that close in any large election. So, like, let's just abandon the idea that there's some rational reason to vote. That's okay. So that means that even if I know the belief I hold will hurt me specifically, I'm still empowered to vote against my own interest because it doesn't change the result of the election. So there's a book uh, called What's the Matter with Kansas? And they, they go through all these arguments about how people in Kansas vote against their own economic self-interest, which is one explanation for how people vote. So we can even predict that people will vote against their own self-interest, what causes this rational irrationality. Okay, so let me give you some examples. There's an epistemic concern here, meaning the way that we get knowledge about things is determined by our party. Right? Is there any reason you believe that the, the claim about a factual thing about temperature change uh, being related to human activities should matter if you're a Democrat or a Republican? And I'll ask you another question, which is, if, are the Democrats biased and the Republicans biased and the independents correct? Right? How would you start to even begin on, on, on deciding who has the correct informed position here? But we know that by party, you're going to move one way or the other. The way you collect information, the way you confirm information you've collected, all of these psychological reasons to believe that people take information about justified true beliefs from groups, that social nature, means that they're gonna believe strange things at the margin. There's a differential here based on party. We can predict it by how you identify as a party. Here's another way to present that same point. This was collected at Fair Oaks Mall uh, in DC, this data. And what they were trying to figure out is how people felt about invading the Ukraine, okay? So they asked people to label where you think the Ukraine is in the world, okay? And then depending on your answer, whether you wanted to invade or not invade, if you wanted to invade, your answer was coded blue. If you did not want to invade, 
your answer was coded red. So people that thought Ukraine is in Nebraska and Omaha, where I'm from, <coughs> wanted to invade. Okay. This is, remember, this is Pharaoh Tall. This is like, these are people that live near DC, that somebody in their family works in the federal government. Right? These are most of them by, by statistics, like most of them have master's degrees. Okay. So they're making a decision to invade, and then they're covered blue. They don't want to admit it, they're probably more poor, right? So there's systematic biases in the types of answers you're going to get. All right. So it's just expressive voting. Like, Peter and I, like, love our football teams. He's wearing a shirt. I'll show you a picture of my kid if you ask. I'm wearing an Alabama shirt. I wore a crazy tie today. Um, but we care a lot about these things. I think that's really healthy, right? We care about things that can't really do much damage, aside outside of the occasional bar fight. <laughs> right? Other people care really intensely about things that actually lead to policy and war and all that other kind of stuff. So I think we're actually taking the rational choice of admitting that we're only going to care intensely about things that ultimately don't matter. <laughs> all right, so you pick your, your party shoes, right? These are your party shoes. So you've got a choice between the Democrats and the Republicans. Wow. These are Thomas' shoes. <laughs> so we believe this about all kinds of things. These are my examples of how people have systematically crazy ideas on and are actually a matter of public policy. So whether or not you should regulate GMOs, right? whether or not you should vaccinate your kids or whether there's a reason to sort of have a, a, a libertarian reason to not vaccinate your kids. It's funny because my wife's German, so there's no such thing as a problem with MSG in Germany. People do it all the time. It's called a Geschmackstacke, and it's a MSG uh, thing that people put in soup and other stuff. They add it to everything. It's on every table where they have soup or, or anything like that. No one has ever complained about increased headaches or anything like that. In this country, it's taken for granted that there's a definite connection between MSG and headaches, right? But it's just a path-dependent belief. Right? Nobody's ever cared to, to investigate it, but it's a very strong. I suggest if you're going to believe some sort of weird conspiracy, you investigate the uh, moon conspiracy. You can spend a lot of time there. It's highly entertaining, right? It's, it's great. Like, I don't have any problem with it. It doesn't matter, ultimately, to me, whether it's true or not. So you can believe really interesting conspiracy theories. And, and there's a lot of fun in that. But the, this one is relatively harmless compared to some of the other ones. Right? And then even just talking about who's likely to get involved, you get into arguments that don't seem to track them. All right, so if people are systematically misinformed, right, then the odds of, of getting this feedback mechanism correct have gone down. So you have the hardcore partisans, and then you have the people who are swinging. And if the, if the people who are swinging the vote are systematically biased, that's going to be a problem. And then the vote's not going to be going well. Okay. So here was my old number line. If I think people are systematically biased, I'm now drawing a reference maybe you have to support voters. But people are going to be systematically moved to one side rather than the other, and now the median voter falls where it doesn't matter. Right? The median voter is already determined on this red line right in the middle. Right? So the systematic bias wins regardless of how people inform themselves. Okay. So that's all reasons to be suspect of voting. So we said that voting how it ought to work, how I think it does work. So, of course, we're going to try to come up with agents. Right? We're going to try to come up with representatives that can filter out some of this stuff. So we don't vote directly for all of our policy issues. We vote for representatives, right? So let's talk about that. In this case, what I'd say is if you want a principal uh, and an agent, you, you're the principal and you want an agent, it's your agency. What you ultimately want to think about agency is, is authorship of the principal, you. Do you get to determine the outcome? Do you get to get your understanding of the world, your information, and you value into the system, your agency. And does the, the does your agent or your representative reflect you as the principal's decision? Now this is something you guys do on a routine basis. You evaluate it actually. How many people have car insurance? Do you buy it online? Everybody buys their insurance online now? Okay. So do you anybody do a life insurance policy or thinking about doing that? Are you going to talk to somebody, right? Are you worried that they're going to bias your result, what policy you buy, 
towards their own interests, towards their sales quota, towards the type of policy they get the most commission on, all that kind of stuff. Right, you already know this in every agent relationship that there is a chance of being biased, right? So we were talking earlier this morning about loan officers and how loan officers can have an incentive to give you a, you know, make you borrow more on your house because they're gonna tell you, well, look how much your house value is rising every year. And you'll have equity, more equity next year if you just take out this mortgage now because you live in a great house in a great area. Um, so you can have problems with agency. You guys are all aware of that in your normal interaction. Do you think about your political representative as an agent? Do you think of them as someone that's meant to work in your interest, but if you do, the, if you make the wrong choice, they're going to work against your interest? So that you really are kind of interested in how you choose people based on how well they're representing your interest. Or are you making a vote simply on whether or not they're blue or, or red? So how do you think about your agent? Because there's plenty of reasons to believe that an agent would benefit from all of the division of labor, right? An idealized insurance agent or mortgage broker or anything like that would have more information, would develop expertise, would have connections with other people. So if you're doing something that's rather odd, then they can tell you who to go talk to or talk to them on your behalf. You know, they can save time, right? They don't have to constantly like, switch between different things. They, they're reading the, the regulation changes all the time so they know that's going on. They get better at it. They start recognizing things, they learn by doing, and they offer you products that you would never thought of on your own because you're just looking at it for the first time. And these are all good reasons to have an agent. Same thing with politics, right? You think that your elected representative is going to specialize in something like the, um, the defense uh, committee or, or uh, spending or the banking committee or write really good legislation like Dodd Frank. If you're thinking about it as a division of labor, you would expect these people to invest an incredible amount of resources, become expert at it, and focus on particular policy areas, right? That's just the way that you would want the model to work. Okay, so this is the problem. So I told you earlier that it really matters in politics how we aggregate preferences. How do we deal with contradictory preferences, and how do we deal with asymmetric information? It's a principal agent problem, and you don't have very much information. Are you gonna trust the expertise? Or are you going to fight back against the idea that there's always local knowledge? There are always things that you know that are very difficult to aggregate, or very difficult to systematize, that might cancel each other out. That's some information between you and your neighbor that cancel each other out and can't be aggregated. All right? So that means that what we're really looking for is a politician that's like Solomon. It can make these really hard you know, decisions, right? decide you know, who maybe the, the kid actually Who's, who's maybe this is between the two people coming to solve the decision. That's pretty hard, and I'd say that if you're looking for a Solomon type representative, good luck. Okay. Right, so how do you compare apples and oranges? All right, so this is sort of the way I think it actually does work. All right, so you can think about attracting votes here, or you can think about lobbying, there's different ways. But my concern here is, is that when you think about going and, and getting votes, you're thinking about going door to door. How many people have done this canvassing for, for a candidate or something? Yeah, so you go door to door. But what the message quickly devolves into is don't vote for the other guy. Right? So what would you want the message to look like? And I'll tell you, it's kind of hard because you're bundling a message. If you're like me and you go to the store, you always think it's a better price per item to buy this thing, right? And maybe, you guys actually eat the sun chips, but I don't eat the sun chips. So I have to make a calculation minus the sun chips and whether or not this is a better deal or not. All right, so there's always something in every bundle that's gonna turn you off. And if the only way you can solve these types of bundles is to elevate certain distinct preferences that you have, like uh, people, you know, I teach at a cabin school, so I can immediately think of a list of things that people care a lot about, right, that are single issue voting things. But you're collapsing the entire bundle policy to a single issue, or you're elevating it. So, you know, you're like, you know, I really like Doritos. But that doesn't, that means you should buy Doritos, not buy a bundle of a bunch of different chips, just because you can get the value. Right? So, I'm always worried about political decision making when you vote for candidates, because candidates, by their very nature, have a problem with things, some things you agree with, some things you don't agree with, and what are you licensing when you vote for somebody that has positions you disagree with? You're saying that I'm making some sort of trade-off 
that the Doritos are just that much better than the Sun Chips. But the other problem is lobbying, right? So rather than just going door to door and getting people to vote for you based on the kind of appeals you can make and the kind of rational things, what you want to do is you actually want to run political ads. And in order to run political ads, you need to cozy up to entrance. Right? So you got to get the money. Here's what kind of the money looks like. Notice that there's more at stake over time. Right? There's more over time. There's been a dramatic increase in the amount of money in politics, which means that it matters more. Right? It, it just matters more who gets elected because the power that's divvied out from the government, especially in this case presidential spending, the power that's divvied out has just increased. So you would expect people to bid more for it. Now notice that there's sort of a narrative here in the numbers that's hidden. Like when was uh, Citizens United? What year was that? 2010? Okay. So there's a change. But if I didn't show you this graph, you would, you would tell me that this change happened. But you wouldn't recognize that this was already sort of much, much larger. So you would say that Republicans probably did better as a result of Citizens United, but you wouldn't reference it to the just absolute dominance of Democratic support in the preceding years. Okay. So there's definitely been a change. So the narrative you heard is partially true, but how you incorporate that information is, is kind of interesting. Um, I just put this up here just because, you know, if you think that unions are just a really good group that's helping everybody out, finding a good fight, I mean, that probably doesn't bother you, but if you think of it as sort of the union dominance of political contributions, then that might be a story that you want to investigate. All right, so which agents are desirable? What we need in public choice are two sort of characteristics of our agents that we're looking for. We want them to uh, be benevolent, and we also want them to be omniscient. We chipped away a little bit about the omniscience. Um, now I'm going to try to talk a little bit about benevolence. Right? So which agents do you actually see elected? Okay. This is Pericles, this is Mary Quimby. Right. Which one do you actually see being elected? Right. So it's not a pure case. Again, I'm not making sort of an idealized case that we always have politicians. I'm just saying empirically, let's ask the question, what kind of politicians do we see? So what we, what we want to do with the economic approach, the benefit of adding the economic approach is actually trying on this methodological individual. That only means in this context that we don't let our politicians have two different hats. We don't have them be completely self-interested when they're running a business and go cutthroat and run everybody out of business and do everything in their self-interest, maximize profit, all that kind of stuff, and then when they get in the political realm, they become altruistic. They're other thinking, other regarding, they never do anything for their own interest. If they were self-interested before they got into politics, they're going to be self-interested when they get into politics. That's all I'm asking. Right? So we're not going to make a firm distinction. We're not going to go back and say that they're homo economicus outside of politics and zoom politicon when they're in politics. We just want to, right? that's the methodological individual that's important, is that they're making decisions the same way, they model action in the same way. All right. So then rational choice would tell us that they have a goal, and I can pretty much figure out what the goal is. No matter what else they want to maximize, we can model them really carefully by whether or not they get reelected. Right? No matter how good your ideas are, if you're not reelected, they're, they're zero. They're zero and zero. Okay? So what the rational part of this is, is just instrumental rationality. It's aiming at something. And you don't have to hit it to be aiming at it. Right? All you have to do is sort of be better than the next guy and get reelected. Okay? So no matter how good the intentions of, of people are, they make compromises along the way in order to get reelected. And you can decide how fully, how full this goes by saying, you know, how many compromises do they have to make? They just have to out-compromise the next person. Okay? All they have to do is make sufficient numbers of compromises to get elected. And if it's a highly contested, highly valuable office where everything's at stake, you would expect that it's going to be much higher degree of compromise. So people that run in their local neighborhood uh, board and like it and have solved problems and got people to you know, pick up dog food off the streets and all kind of stuff and they had success doing that and are good politicians, then they start running at the state level. 
And you think at the state level, they feel like, yep, they're still good, they're still doing everything, right? So in Nebraska, this is somewhat reasonable to think that some people still feel good about themselves at the state level, but they never get, you know, I've heard some of them, some of them professors are great. They tell me, I would never run for federal office because you have to be corrupt to do that. But in your state, maybe it's different. Maybe you have to be corrupt to even do state level. Where is that line? Where would you call? I'm just, I'm, I'm happy calling people corrupt, so um, my line's a lot further down than most people. Politics has changed to fix, but there will be property rights in voting. So let's just look at Congress. So the House of Representatives has a whole bunch of committees with a whole bunch of rules about seniority, and because of those rules of seniority, we can vote trade. Okay? You vote for my bill, I'll vote for you, your bill. The way we get reelected is, is putting projects, spending money in our district, so as long as you will vote for me, I'll vote for you down the road, and because we develop these alliances, we're gonna get trade. Now, Gordon Tullock says trade is great, right? And the reason he says this is because if you have a sufficiently log-rolling Congress, then you're going to get outcomes that kind of track the market, it's a signal of value. I will only trade votes with people whose projects don't upset my constituency. Right? I will make good trades. I'll try to I'll treat my trade as a valuable resource. And I'll trade for those kind of things likely to get me the most votes in the future. Politics exchange allows for some sort of discipline within Congress, but you don't usually think of it this way if you come at it from a political idealist lens. You think of it as a market, or you think about law and All right. So here's an example of a wonderful person who took this to the extreme. And I say wonderful because he's extreme, not wonderful because I like what he did. Um, Tom DeLay developed a, a thing called catch and release. That he had such a lockdown on Congress. In fact, he, he created a, a source of credibility. He went through and took senior people off of their preferred committees to punish them for not playing ball. Right? And as a result, came in with a whole group of young uh, representatives, took, you know, as the House was, was shifting Republican, and they did everything he said. They had to vote his way. And then we calculate where they are in terms of winning the vote. He had them. The idea of the catch is that there was an absolute 100% commitment that if you were Republican, you were voting in his direction. And then he would let you trade out on things that would be particularly hurtful to you in your reelection. If you were close to reelection, or if you were uh, if you were voting, if you were voting for something that would be a blatant contradiction of what you had run on, you could get out of it. But he would decide he would release you to vote against the bill. Right? Ultimately, he was indicted. I think that, I personally think that's a result of how he pissed off senior ranking members, people that have been there a long time, and they allow all of that to go forward. So the problem went away after you know, a, little while, a little while anyway. But this was such a perfect example of what you would expect from an entrepreneur in a market setting, given that that market setting is the House of Representatives. All right, so is it merely a matter of sorting? Can we get rid of the top delays? If you like that approach, you should definitely be to invest with. That's what you were thinking in the back of your head, is like, but we can just get rid of all the top delays by setting up institutions that clean up the system and only catch the, the good guys, right? We'll just change the institutions to sort out all of these unethical people. Anyone who reads on us, he's at the London School of Economics, it's, it's a good book. It'll take a little bit of math, but you can get the gist of it if you don't want to do that. All right, or is it just simply the institution themselves? So this is an age-old question of, can you be Ulysses and hear the siren call of politics without crashing the ship? Right? So you have to figure out a way to tie the mask. And it cannot be that you allow them to tie themselves, right? Because anybody that can tie themselves can untie themselves. So it has to be some sort of constraint. So if you think about politics the way I'm thinking about it from this realist perspective, and you want to design institutions that significantly constrain the actors. All right. So incentives matter. I'd say don't hate the player, hate the game. Just like we talk about other aspects of our lives. All right, so that's agency. So what I've told you now is that you can't just go directly to voting. You probably already knew that. We just talked about some reasons why things are systematically biased. I also think those systematic biases matter for electing representatives, but I also think the agency itself is not a solve-all to the problem. 
All right, so what are the implications? Why did I spend all this time critiquing politics and telling you an economic perspective? Well, it has to have you see the world differently. It has to collect different types of information. And it will structure the conversations, your conversations, my research, whether you guys will want to do research or not. I think it structures the way we talk about the world in a different way. <coughs> all right, so what should you do now that you know? You should have a toolbox. Everybody has a toolbox? It's a metaphorical toolbox you probably already have. And you put in all of these different pairs of glasses. You have your idealist set of lenses. You need those. That's not my job to tell you about that. Mark's job to tell you about why idealism works and why you have to have it and, and why you know, you're not a very good human being if you don't have it. Okay? I, Mark, uh, love him. He puts up with me even though I don't have that part of my brain. Okay? And then here are other lenses. Right here's maybe your nerd econ lens, your realist lens. And here's some other stuff right, that you care about. And you put them all in your toolbox, and the question is just a question of practical wisdom. When do you look at the world with each set of glasses? How do you, how do you balance how much of the time you spend thinking about it one way or another? Right? So I've given you sort of the public choice lenses. Have them in your toolkit. Don't use them all the time. Right? Don't stare at the sun. Don't wear your sunglasses or shorts. So here's kind of an example that I think will help you think about. I don't know if you've thought about hair braiding before. Right? But here's hair braiding. Right? So you braid hair. And you have to have the license in most states. Nebraska just happens to be a state that just repealed the licensing required for hair braiding. Right? But the idea is that people are already hair braiding for their children, for their nieces and nephews, you know, things like this. And what you're saying is if they wanted to sell that service in a market, they'd have to have a cosmetology license. So that just seems cruel, right? Like you're, you're taking people, a lot of people, you know, some of these people, some percentage of the people are going to be in circumstances where this would be a nice extra income. They're willing to do this with their neighbors or people in their school, stuff like this. So can they make a few bucks hair braiding? Well, if you're following the reasons why we license from sort of a, an idealized version to protect the consumer, then you're going to say, no, right? this is a threat, this is dangerous, to allow people to sell this service. If you're thinking about it from an economic perspective, you're, you know, you're saying, let's look at the actual graph, the rent saving graph. Here is the wealth transfer, right? so this is the area. Uh, so the old price was here, the original price was here. Here's the price after you restrict competition by requiring 300 hours to license it. Okay? So the amount of service provided goes from this amount of service provided to this amount of service provided. Here you have people doing it for friends and neighbors, part-time, after school, just when they're bored on the weekends. Here you have only people doing it in a hygienic environment where they have to set up a shop and they have to post the license after they've got 300 hours of cosmetology, cosmetology training. Okay. So the question is, if you know predictably that you can restrict entry and get to this point, as long as you have a demand curve that slopes downward, then you can predict that you can charge a higher price due to the restriction and read an additional rent. So for every unit produced, you used to get this price, now you get the higher price. The area of the total wealth created for the incumbents in that scenario is the red box. Right? It used to go to the consumers in terms of other things they could have spent money on. Right? If I got my hair cut for $10 and I have to pay $15, that's $5 I don't have to do something else with. So that's a wealth transfer. It also means that all of the people here that would have had their hair braided aren't getting their hair braided. And that can be measured as a loss to society in the consumer surplus that would have existed in that triangle. Nobody gets that. There's the transfer. That's the deadweight loss. Right? So maybe you don't care too much about hair braiding, but you can see this systematically over a whole bunch of industries. This one's just a fairly clear example. Um, do you, do you think you should have a cosmetology license at all? Is this the way that you guys actually get your hair done? Do you check out the license when you go in to get your hair cut? Right? Do, you, do you base it on the fact that the store has a reputation, a national reputation or something? Or that the style has a reputation? And so if you base it on the idea that the, that the company providing the base is doing their due diligence, that's one thing. That's one thing to think about. If you're doing it based on the fact
fact that you know that that person cuts good hair, then you're thinking that the license really doesn't do much other than restrict entry. Okay? So for the guys in the room, you're probably much more likely to say, I'll risk a bad haircut, right? <laughs> Not you, you have more hair. You have short hair to, for this argument to work. If you have short hair, right, so Mark is over there saying, yeah, if I ever had somebody cut my hair, I, I could grow it back really easily. <laughs> Okay, the shorter your hair, the less concerned you are about it. My daughter has long hair. If somebody cut off, you know, instead of two inches, cut off six inches, I'd be really upset. It would take a long time to grow back. I wouldn't be able to put in the Elsa braid that she likes so much. <laughs> that would make a huge difference in my quality of life. So I want to make sure that I know that that person is a reasonable person before they are allowed to cut. But for my hair, I'll just grow it back. So I'm willing to take risks. I used to get my hair cut for $4 at the barber school. You probably were thinking I still go there. <laughs> All right. So then, what are you looking for, James? Right. So now that you now that you have a different way of sort of interpreting the information, now you're starting to look at information differently. So here, anybody seen uh, the Boardwalk Empire? Okay. Or this is Becky Thompson. And if you can't read this behind there, if you've seen the show, you know he's at a women's Christian temperance meeting, and he's telling people that it will fix the world if we outlaw liquor. Right? Me, he's the mayor of, of Atlantic City at the time. And so he's saying, I'm completely on board. I'm a Republican. The Republicans are behind you. Vote for uh, prohibition. Let's make this happen. The world will be a better place. And he's right, because the world is a better place for him. He got a lot of money moved by alcohol as a result of the law. So we have to we have to look for the bootlegger in the Baptist story, the bootlegger here being Matthew Thompson. He's at a women's Christian temperance organization, the Baptist, so to speak. And they have aligned interests because they can profit from these restrictions. So it's not that people aren't, sorry, I've done some research on this. It's not that people are not genuinely well-intentioned. It's just they become useful fools for people that stand to get economic rents from them. Right? They, you know, Billy Sunday advocating for prohibition was absolutely 100%, I believe, on board with the idea that hell would, would have forever a vacancy sign and there would no longer be domestic violence at all if we got rid of alcohol. I think he believed that. It just happened to be wrong and he was spreading misinformation. Right? But the people that allowed him, the people that paid for his Sunday and Chautauqua meetings, probably some of them were bootleggers helped him get his message out. Right? That's just alcohol prohibition. Idea. So we have to think about that. But then you have the EpiPen. What are people targeting here with this conversation about the EpiPen? So what do you know about the EpiPen? Prices went up how many times? Like 400%? Four, yeah. Okay. So the EpiPen, the actual stuff in the pen cost about one and a half cents to make. Um, so let's try to figure out how this happens, right? This is this is the economic, the realist position. So we don't just have a knee-jerk reaction that these people are horrible. They are. I mean, I'm trying to be really mine with that. You know, there's no love I have for, for any of these these people. Um, so we'll call them horrible. I don't know. It doesn't bother me. But what we want to do is try to figure out how it happens. Right? So why are they raising the price so much? Because they can. Why can't they? Well, the FDA doesn't allow for competition. That's one side of the story. So new entrants are, are barred. How much, right? how much energy is the CEO Consider lobbying as one of your expenses, then the cost of the everything is a lot higher. Right? So I think that's there's, there's some important points in there. Um, what I would say is that it's now required for most schools to have everything. Right? 
that, that, that means they're in, in elastic demand. They, they expire. Right? You have to replace them. Right? Part of how we know when they expire is through the regulation process. But every year you have to replace them. So if you do your standard uh, revenue maximization, right, trying to figure out the elasticity and the maximum total revenue under the curve, um, you should raise price. Right? In an elastic demand curve, you should raise price. I'll talk about that later in the next lecture. But if they can get away with it, if they can do it, if, if the demand is elastic, we predict that they'll do it. Then the question is whether or not you should think that it's because they're evil or if it's because of the institutional environment they're in. And if it's because they're evil, then there's nothing to do about it except just like retaliate with other laws and price caps and other things that will distort the market. But if it's an institutional framework, we can start chipping away at the institutional framework to figure out are there better ways to do this, right? Is the patent that actually on that delivery device, is it justified? Is the patent link that we have for all of these um, health implements, is that the right link for time? Right? We start asking all kinds of questions, but those questions only come after you've thrown off the political idealistic lens. Now, it doesn't mean that it's out of your toolkit. It just means you take it off temporarily and look at the world with the, the weirdo economist glasses. Just to sort of get the landscape apart. So then what kind of questions do you start asking? What kind of research? So this is my wife's paper with uh, Ben Blanc on the rock. And they went and they did all the things. And, and they actually delayed in publishing this after TARP. They waited a little bit because they had to check the numbers. Because the result they got is that $1 in money helps explain $500 of TARP. That's enormous. That's an incredibly enormous return. <coughs> Let's think at the margin. What that means is that to get $500 of rent, you only have to expend $1. Okay? That's an incredible return. What would you predict? Entry, right? Like if anybody could get that kind of return on lobbying, you'd expect more people to lobby. Well, that brings up an institutional question. What is it that actually restricts people to gain the type of access they need to be effective with lobbying? So that's a follow-up paper that they haven't figured out how to write yet. But what they have to do is they have to go figure out what are the paths of access into lobbying. What types of relationships and uh, social networks and all those kind of things predict someone being effective at lobbying. And why is it such a restricted quantity of people that are actually effective at working for banks and lobbying for talk? How is, how is that such a well-oiled machine that you can you can sustain such a low expenditure for a rent that's, that's this large. We just know right now that it exists. Now we have to explain why it exists. You start asking those questions. And I don't think you're asking those questions if you just look at it as far as a as sort of evil businesses. As banks are just bad. So we're at the QA section. Of the, of the talk, we've been talking about an hour. I posted these three questions just to get you started. If you wanted to, uh, maybe turn to your, your neighbor and ask a couple of questions, see if you guys can figure something out, and then we'll throw it back to the front. Uh, so let's take like two minutes to, to talk amongst ourselves, pair, pair off the talkers. Here's some questions to get you started. Okay, so now we can kind of pitch it back out. I just wanted to give you guys a chance to take around and hear some more. Thank 
Do you guys generally apply this as, a, as a, another perspective that's somewhat, sometimes useful? Yeah, so, so Adam Smith um, started talking about the world this way. He started saying, look, obviously there's differences in what we would call IQ, we would call it IQ. Um, but he said that, look, the, the real difference between someone that works for a living as a street person that carries things for other people in the city of London, uh, so you want something heavy over to your house, uh, and a philosopher is, is some can be natural and down. But he says that's totally overemphasized. Most of it's just habit. The sort of things that people do routinely and become accustomed to really explain most of the difference. So there's differences in IQ, but there we overestimate the impact of that all the time. That's Adam Smith's point. Okay, so we can evaluate whether that's true or not. I just think it's a really interesting way to think about the world. But what comes out of that is a strong sense of analytical egalitarian, meaning that was a phrase that was coined by a group of people who love Adam Smith. Um, what comes out of that is that you start treating people as if they can make decisions. And, and you don't have that strong hierarchy. So I think what Mark was talking about earlier is you know, this, this type of quality of, of authority. I would say agency or authorship, things like that are all important. So I think those are potential paths for people that and those are not necessarily economic numbers. I would just want to be whether you guys write about that. Um, how do we view people as relatively similar? Let's de-emphasize the difference. So on one avenue, I think you're right, we tend to think elected officials are smarter than everybody else because they got elected to office. And we emphasize things like they went to Harvard or something. So they must be able to make better decisions. I think that's overplayed. The second thing that they've gone to when that doesn't is we have access to classified information. So you just don't know the actual facts. So even if we're the same level of intelligence, because I'm elected, I have special information that we don't have. So you just have to trust me. I think that's become relatively more important as we've gotten more used to just through being on the internet. So I like it. Like the presumption that when I go in the classroom is no longer that I'm smarter than anybody else. It's just that I've done it longer. Right? So I've seen some of those arguments before. Well, like recently, there's been a lot of discussion about the uh, NRA and their influence on politicians, and maybe that is why, regardless of where you fall on the agenda, that how much gun control you should have or shouldn't have. Um, is, you know, a lot of people, uh, there's been several people who've done kind of some analysis on how much money is actually being donated by the NRA to different I think we have these institutional questions and we want to 
we want to think about how we approach fixing the institutions, right? So what's the goal? The goal is to get good information. The goal is to set up a system where everybody has the best chance of having the justified true belief. Right? So thinking about how we're going to set the system up so that false information doesn't flourish and good information gets out there, that's really, that's like my main concern right now. And so how do you take insights from economics and that, that people have, people that are economists have actually looked at the information and are pretty confident about, how do you get those actually into the political debates in the first place? People believe a lot of things that aren't so. So here is, here's a, a chart where people were asked a bunch of questions about how much, how much of the federal budget is actually spent in these areas. And the correct answers are highlighted. Um, so it seems like people should be aware that they don't know the answer, which is a really large number, and they're not sure that. But it's not that people are saying they're unsure. They're saying that they, they have a good idea of what it is. They guess they're just wrong, systematically. The highest uh, category reporting for correct when they asked if, if, if it were above 20% and 41% of the people said that the Fed spending was above 20% as a category. So they're given categories to select and they can choose not sure. But they stay putting them and they're wrong. So there are a lot of reasons why that might be. And this might be just the way people react to certain questions and things like that. But the idea that people are unjustified in their beliefs but they still don't indicate that they have beliefs. That's what we're really trying to work with. How do we cause, how do we create a system? So what Kaplan's response is, do less with voting, right? Because the incentives of voting are not allowing to have people form true beliefs. Um, when I, it's it good to Then the voting system will be more idealized. 
right? It'll move towards being able to flip the marginal election, the marginal decision on that issue <coughs> towards information. So this is really easy. I mean, like, it's not that it's not that people in Nebraska, in the Senate, anybody that was in, living in Nebraska, whether you're a citizen or not, can go down to the legislature and walk on the floor and talk on an issue. Right? So they have public hearings, they're scheduled, they can go in and talk. The people that, that spend a lot of time talking are people that are disproportionately, uh, they have disproportionately more time on their hands, whether it's either because they're really rich or whether it's because they're out of work. Right? So the information that the senators collect on these issues are supplied to them by a biased selection of people. And they vote based on the information they have. So what I can do is I can, where, when I talk about minimum wage, I can go in and say, here's what the profession is, or it's the state of the art of the discussion in the profession, here's what you should think about. My wife went down and testified on driver's license for uh, illegal immigrants uh, that were under the DREAM Act. So Nebraska was the only state that had people that couldn't get licensed, even though they qualified under the DREAM Act in every other state as someone who could get a license. So she just explained, right? Like, what are you trying to do here? What are your goals? Here are a couple of examples of what your goals might be. And here's how you can't reach your own goals based on the policy that you're taking. And they ended up uh, making it okay for good data licenses. So I, mean, I think that good information, if you put it targeted in tight feedback environments, you can actually change policy towards justified treatment. Kind of want to follow up on that. Um, I like what you're saying here, but um, uh, when Matt Kibbe, before he gave a talk one time, uh, it sort of goes to your cynicism and skepticism idea, right? Um, said, I'm a public choice economist, which means I understand why the system works the way it does. But I'm a public choice economist, which means I know I don't know how to fix right, <laughs> what's wrong with this, right? Which is sort of what Meg's getting at. And so your, your idea of costs and you know, raising relative prices and costs, if you will, of, of, of this information is an interesting one that I hadn't thought about. But you know, I go back to the idea of this is why, right? This is why we need the constraints. This is why we need Ulysses tied to the mass, right? Um, what do we do to suggest to people, aside from information costs, right? that it's, it's not the, let's just get better people in here, but let's really look at the institutions and understand that these are going to be the outcomes as long as we have these institutional arrangements. I mean, I think what we're doing is having a conversation about that and trying to spread that message. Like, I think everybody knows the stuff I said today, right? That, that your agents are not doing a good job representing your interests. I think we know that. And hopefully the information helps you structure that argument so that at the margin, every conversation you have, you can say, look, this is where we want it, this is how we want it to work, this is how it tends to work, how can we fix it? How can we move it slightly towards what we, what everybody sort of assumes it should work like, therefore we're going to just pretend like it doesn't work. Let's actually do something with it that takes account of that. It's certainly easy to just move things into separate environments. So what capital sort of comes down as, to say, look, the political system has really bad incentives. Market systems have much tighter feedback because when you make really crazy uh, claims in the market, right, that I'm going to be really profitable the next year, and you're not, then you leave the market. The exit is what disciplines the market. Um, there's all this, all these epistemic reasons why you would like the market. So at the margin, any decision that we could put into the political sphere versus the market, we should put into the market. So that's going to be scaling back the size of government or the scope of government. There are two arguments there about whether it should be scale or scope. Um, so that's fine for marginal decisions, right? But there are plenty of things that you, you would tell me are just not marginal decisions, right? This, this, if people have these beliefs and they come from idealistic reasons, right? Government should do this thing, right? And that's an idealized argument, therefore it's not marginal what you require of government. But for every decision where you're trying to go one way or the other, you want it to be in the feedback system where the feedback is tighter. Okay. So there should be a bias, in my opinion, to any decision you can possibly get away with putting in the market in the market. Because at least there's discipline. If there's no discipline over here, 
is the just one over here. So that's kind of a complicated record. Okay, so there used to be this thing you would hear all the time, all politics is local. I don't really think that's true. And uh, last night, uh, this uh, case was put forward, uh, this idea about, um, well, they didn't use the term states' rights, so it was kind of idea that, you know, ideas maybe should be handled at the state and the federal government should somehow be in shape. So I'm wondering, does public choice have an answer for why it appears that power flows the other way? 200 years ago, all the power was in the state, or maybe even at the municipality level, and now it's uh, kind of the other way. Yeah, I mean, there's reasons to believe that you would want, uh, and so we've we talked about that, I don't know if that was online or offline last night, but there are reasons to believe that when institutions are, are wildly different between states, and some states will have the right institutions, other states will have the wrong institutions. And so if that's obvious from a third party perspective, and that third party can make an unbiased decision, then they're gonna select the institutions that are better between states. So it's very common for people to look at South Carolina and South Carolina and say they've done a lot of things wrong. So we need federal pressure to make sure that they do other things. Now luckily recently it's only North Carolina that they're doing right? they're doing well. But um, so you can you can take that perspective that there's sort of a judge or a referee from, from that level. Um, there are reasons to believe that right so like in Nebraska it's a perfect example. These are part-time legislatures that uh, people meet twice, they get paid something, I think they've opted to $12,000 a year for, for their service. That's not a full-time job, you gotta work another job to, yeah. to be a legislator. The same here. Uh, so how are these people gonna become experts? The whole division of labor argument that I said to the representatives means that they're not doing the division of labor. Right? These are amateur politicians by, by the federal standards. So if you have career bureaucrats and career politicians get nice salaries at the federal level, there's a tendency to think that they're going to have much more informed policy conclusions. Now, whether that works or not, that's an empirical question, but that's been a possible explanation for why people would defer to federal level. Okay, so it follows. I don't know if that's a public choice argument, maybe, but, but there's a downside too, like you get out of control, like if South Carolina decides that, okay, we're just not going to decide this here, we'll let it be decided at the federal level then uh, we only have one fiftieth of the control that we used to have. So it seems like it would be pushback. I don't I think there it. is pushback. I mean, like, we can look at all the states that are trying to stop uh, um, Medicaid expansion with the ACA. I mean, you can look at that as pushback. And there's systematic evidence of that. I mean, Louisiana refused to do the 21-year-old uh, the drinking age for forever. There were other states that were involved in that at the beginning, but then the bills came to it and they had to pay for that. US DOT had money and they, they played ball. Um, so you can go through most of the, the earlier stuff was EPA restriction. Right? So there were certain um, mandates that were passed on to the states by the federal government to meet the EPA guidelines. And if you followed those mandates, then you got money. So, um, and the money sometimes didn't stay around. And right? they were left with a lot of federal discretion as opposed to state level discretion. So there are a bunch of reasons to, to think that this is happening systematically over 